Starting. Welcome, everyone. We'll just give everyone a chance to get into the meeting and then we'll kick off. Thank you very much for that. Okay. That's all I need to do for the moment. Yes, that's everything. Thanks, Nathan. Excellent. Don't worry. You have a lovely day. Thank you, you too. Bye. Okay, it looks like we've got most people on board, so we might start. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar. It's Environmental Justice Amid COVID-19. My name is Jamila Hallinan and I'm the Director of the Legal Outreach Program in the EDO Sydney office. So the purpose of this webinar is to give you a snapshot of how COVID-19 is intersecting environmental justice around Australia. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that wherever we're zooming in from today, we are all on Aboriginal land. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Mm -hmm. Our speakers today are Revel Poynton, who's our senior solicitor in our Brisbane office. Daniel Bakewell, who's a lawyer in our citizen representation program based in Cairns, and Nicole Sommer, who's the managing lawyer of our Hobart office. They're each going to speak to you for about 10 to 15 minutes, and there's going to be time for questions at the end. So in terms of questions, it would really help us because there's so many Sound. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Sorry, I just got muted for a second. So um, in terms of questions, it would be great if you could um, put your questions in the chat, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. You might need to hover over it to bring up the chat. If you could write your questions in there, I'll be collating them and we'll be able to um, get to those at the end. So. Um, the other thing that would really help us um, is if you could all put yourselves on mute so that we don't get too much background noise um, coming across the, the audio. Okay, so I'd like to begin by um, just telling you a little bit about the EDO and what we do. Um, so we're an environmental law practice that seeks to protect the Australia Pacific region by delivering um, legal solutions um, for people, nature and climate. We use a variety of strategies to do that. We provide legal advice and representation. We provide legal information and education, like this webinar. Uh, we advocate for better laws and we are all supported by a fantastic team of scientists who help us with the more technical aspects of, of our work. The information that we're going to be sharing with you today is just that, it's information and it's not legal advice. If you need advice, please visit our website. It's um, www.edo.org.au for information on how you can access our free legal advice um, services. So our focus today is on changes to the law in respect of COVID-19 that will impact the environment and those seeking to protect it. 
So things like changes to planning laws that fast track development and changes to laws around public participation and protesting. Our work in this space is about keeping a close eye on the decisions that are being made during COVID-19 and encouraging decision makers to take this opportunity to put in place the legal settings that will lead us towards a sustainable future with a safe climate. Revel is up first. She will provide an overview of the changes made to planning and environmental laws as a result of COVID-19. And she'll critique this against the first <coughs> five principles the EDO has developed to ensure sorry I just got muted again I think I'm good to go <laughs> um, so yeah she she's going to critique that against the first of five uh, three of five principles that the EDO has developed to help ensure environmental justice is upheld during this period Daniel is then going to talk to you about the relationship between protest and And Nicole will finish up by explaining what yeah. our laws need to look like as our governments move towards economic recovery. And the key issues we'll be keeping an eye on. So I'll hand you over to Revel now. Thank you. Everybody, I'm very sorry for muting people. I am. Um, I'm trying to just, uh, ensure people stay on mute. So well, I mean, for some reason, people were muted on the way in. So it would be wonderful if people could um, mute themselves if they haven't already, and just stay on there until um, and pop any um, questions in the chat um, that we have. So thank you so much for joining us. As Jamila said, it's so wonderful to see so many of you interested in, um, in these hot topics. I want to start by recognising that I'm on the land today of the Turbal and Jagera peoples and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and express my strong desire for more justice for First Nations peoples in this country. So as Jamila mentioned, I'll be providing an overview of the first tranche of law reforms provided through COVID relating to providing emergency powers, amendments to permits, deregulating activities and enabling activities to continue that would otherwise require physical presence. Um, I'll start by giving a quick reminder of how we got there and then and the work EDO has been doing that, um, during this period. So Obviously, we had a declaration of a global pandemic from the WHO that came on the 11th of March. From the periods of 29th of January to the 22nd of March, national and subnational governments around Australia were declaring various types of states of emergency in response to this, um, which then enabled them to activate um, the powers under their laws that might exist or to provide new powers that are needed to address the, the unique challenges of the, of the pandemic. And Australia obviously went into lockdown officially from the 23rd of March. So throughout this period, there have been legislative reforms going through both nationally and subnationally. Um, and EDO has been keeping busy trying to keep watch on these reforms. You can find detailed overviews of the changes made in each jurisdiction on our website. Um, so if, as I'm going through today, you feel like you want to know more, please do check out our website and you'll find each of the jurisdiction has, um, has an overview of the various legislative changes. We are focused on the planning and environment and development laws um, specifically. That's our thing. Um, however, there are other um, sources that provide um, reform overviews um, of say, the various reforms that have been going through. Obviously, most jurisdictions put through appropriation bills um, and there have been other changes that have been needing to be made during this period. Um, so we've been providing overviews. We've been writing to various governments, particularly where these reforms have been provided um, without sufficient accountability measures um, that could have been provided given the uh, range of emergency powers that were being given to, to governments and ministers during this period to raise our concern and just to know that, let them know that we're watching. And we've been providing legal advice and education to the public as we um, always do and as this is part of. So through our scrutiny of the laws, we've developed 
five principles that we saw were necessary to be followed for good governance, good governance, um, especially through environmental protections to be upheld. Through the I think the travel insurance product will um, will quietly resemble what it looks like now, but we. Um, we are hoping to upgrade to webinar capabilities for the next webinar, so please don't be disgruntled um, by this one. And I do apologise for the inconvenience of, um, of uh, not being able to mute everybody for the time being. But for my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the first of the three of these principles. Um, the first looking at um, the emergency powers, that they're basically that they're accountable, that they're temporary, that they're limited only to the public health crisis and some transparency mechanisms are provided over them. Um, the second principle is around ensuring access to justice and procedural fairness is uh, both continued through this period through meaningful and equal opportunities being provided to um, participate in any ongoing consultation or hearings um, that are occurring regardless of the um, the situation we're in, so that everybody um, maintains the same rights as far as possible to engage in decision making. And the third one, that open justice is upheld. And this is the, the right to view justice in, um, that's being, that's being um, undertaken through our courts and tribunals. So particularly that hearings are being able to be accessed by the public by some, way, by some means. Nicole will then later on be talking about principle four and five with a view to reviewing how governments are dealing with economic stimulus measures through this period. So I'll now move to a summary of the various reforms that have been made. Um, many other amendments have been made. As I mentioned, this is just a, um, focused on planning and environment laws. And it's essentially a lot of these reforms have been made to help um, society continue to function as smoothly as possible, given the unique demands and challenges, like for toilet paper and spaghetti <laughs> that can be, um, that came up during this period so that society could continue to operate as normally as possible and people could still access essential services. These reforms are focused mainly on subnational governments who generally have the responsibility of regulating our planning matters. Um, the Commonwealth Government has not as yet made any amendments to our federal environment laws, but these have been foreshadowed, as Nicole will discuss later. Um, but a lot of people have been expressing their concern to us about the changes occurring during the pandemic, as the general public has felt distracted and um, trying to deal with their own issues coming up through the changes of, of COVID-19. Um, so normal parliamentary and decision-making processes have been disrupted and we've really sensed um, a lot of um, concern as to what's going on um, through governments through this period. Hence um, the need for um, EDO's role in keeping a watching eye on this, um, the reforms that are being pushed, pushed through. Um, laws have been passed with urgency without normal committee oversight and public scrutiny due to this urgency and also obviously with limited debate. Um, so given these scenarios, there's a high risk in overriding all our normal accountability checks and balances, um, which provide a mechanism to ensure high quality legislation is being put through that actually meets the public interest. And therefore, governments really have had a responsibility on themselves to ensure that the powers they're providing themselves are subject to checks and balances. On the 20th of April of this year, there was an agreement between the national, uh, sorry, all of the planning ministers around the um, country, as well as the um, federal minister for population, cities and urban infrastructure and the president of the Australian Local Government Association. I guess recognising that there could be community um, doubt and uncertainty about the, particularly the planning law reforms that are going through and providing an attempt to provide some kind of certainty um, and confidence that um, whatever changes are being made are going to be um, generally guided by these principles that they've agreed to that they've, I've got on the slide there. Um, so the principles of um, uh, decision making in the public interest, transparency, um, decisions made, that are consistent where possible. Um, these are good to see and a good start in terms of um, 
in terms of providing some level of um, certainty for, for communities that these, these were matters that were actually being considered for, um, for uh, governments as they're putting these reforms through. But just a quick overview of the reforms. So some governments actually didn't need to put in any more uh, emergency powers to provide for planning changes. Um, for instance, Victoria um, already had sufficient powers to amend permits and deregulate activities where needed under emergency situations. Uh, the Northern Territory was able to make changes to their planning scheme that's relevant to the whole of the Territory without any legislative changes. Other jurisdictions did need to put through emergency powers. Um, for instance, uh, the emergency, an emergency, a power to actually declare an event um, is, is occurring, such as you know, a, that there's a prescribed period, it was known in New South Wales, which can be declared by the planning minister, during which the minister can then exempt developments from, from certain planning requirements. We saw in Queensland, um, there was a power to, for the planning minister to declare an applicable event. Um, so this was an event that then also equally provided broad powers that could diverge from the normal planning requirements and deregulated activities. We also saw in Queensland a power introduced allowing the minister to provide for temporary authorities under our Environmental Protection Act um, to authorise an increase in intensity or scale of activities in response to COVID. But no requirement on these provisions um, that the risk to the environment or community be specifically considered in assessing the application of these authorities, which was a particular concern to, to EDO. Many subnational governments have granted um, very broad powers to make regulations that can um, amend often any other framework needed to address the pandemic. Um, obviously also of concern where regulations have very little accountability measures over them prior to them actually coming into effect. So often the key um, uh, check and balance on regulations is that sub they're subject to disallowance motion um, of, uh, that's put up and then debated for after the regulation is set before parliament for 14 sitting days. However, if parliament's not sitting, <laughs> this check becomes um, somewhat uh, redundant. Um, other reforms have also gone through. Many subnational governments provided broad powers to extend or suspend statutory timeframes, for example, for appeals or lapse dates in New South Wales, or for any other processes under the Planning Act in Queensland, or more broadly under various acts as we saw in South Australia. Um, and many jurisdictions also provided for amendments which allowed for meetings, hearings, um, and physical um, provision of documents to occur without the need for physical presence to, to be uh, required, which is a really sensible measure that we would consider useful to continue on and expand, particularly through our planning and environment laws, um, to enable access to normal processes for anybody around uh, Australia, where so many of us live in regional areas. So how do these reforms fare against the principles we've developed here at EDO? Reminding the one, the principle one requires that emergency powers are subject to accountability, that they're temporary, transparent, and only for responding to the health crisis. So they're not for economic stimulus-based um, activities. So we're happy to see the vast majority of these powers are linked to a requirement for an emergency event of some kind to be declared or a spe specified time period. Sometimes it was the same minister providing the declaration of the time period who was exercising the powers. Um, but in general, there is a requirement for them uh, to consult with some kind of health official in their jurisdiction and have some relevance to protection of health, safety and welfare for their use. Um, we are, however, seeing some of these emergency declarations being extended under powers that were enabled to extend the time frame as needed. Um, for example, this has happened in Queensland and New South Wales. Um, and there's some questions being raised given that these jurisdictions are generally not subject to the same lockdown measures or demands on our essential services that were definitely um, present during the pandemic's um, most intense moments. So we are uncertain um, uh, why all of uh, some of these um, emergency declarations are being extended out, uh, which enables such uh, extensive um, use of powers to, to get around our normal planning systems.
There weren't generally transparency measures provided in the laws themselves, which would be best practice, um, given the extensive and ongoing nature of these law powers. However, many governments are providing for notices to be put online of when these powers are being used and for what kind of activities. So against um, principle two, which is ensuring access to justice and procedural fairness, um, it's great that many processes moved online during this period. Um, some public hearing processes were delayed, but others continued via other means. Um, it's, a, it's a very real reality in Australia that not everybody has reliable internet access, which is a tricky issue to get around when we are locked away and there is a, um, a desire by some sectors of society to continue on with decision-making processes around um, development activities. So we need to find a way through these periods that we can ensure that everybody remains empowered to be involved equally in this. And this definitely came up for the community of um, Narrabri in Northwest New South Wales, who has um, showed immense concern about the Narrabri gas project that has been applied for with 20, uh, 23,000 submissions um, being put um, to the government in, during this period. Um, the public hearing did move online, but obviously not everybody had reliable internet access. And so many submitters who may have wanted to be heard may have missed out on this opportunity. So perhaps the answer could be um, ensuring there are other mechanisms that do provide safe participation, maybe community meeting spaces that enable access to technology, but still safe um, distance measures in place, telephone options, or even to delay the process until the public health emergency is over. Public health, in, uh, well, public officials in general really have to keep in mind that while the country and its citizens are trying to deal with an emergency like this and having significant demands placed on their time, um, it can really hinder their ability to be aware of and sufficiently engage in community engagement opportunities. So we really recommend that this is kept cleanly in mind by decision makers um, in the development sector. Um, during any emergency process and perhaps delaying consultation until the emergency is over seem, may seem like the best option for fair process. And finally, against principle three, um, this principle is, as I mentioned, about ensuring that justice occurs in the open. And most courts and tribunals did continue to keep their um, courts open during the um, heat of the pandemic and the lockdown through, um, but moved to processes um, via telephone or audiovisual means. Um, we understand that many courts and tribunals didn't have the technology in place to just quickly move to um, providing uh, open justice uh, for all of their measures that would normally um, be publicly accessible. However, this is a really good reminder and opportunity for courts and tribunals to really increase the ability for um, communities to participate online um, and view um, hearings at at any moment, given that not all of us live in, in centres with courts and, and there is a public interest in, in viewing justice and also providing electronic filing just um, as, a, as a convenience measure as well. This was relevant for the Shenhua Watermark coal mine, which EDO is representing clients in, who um, where in this case, there was an attempt to allow the public to listen in in real time, but a request had to be made to the judge's associate by the public to do so. So that's it for me. I'll now move over to Daniel, who's going to be providing an overview of how our, um, how protest laws have been affected during this time. And I will admit all of the poor people in the waiting room. <laughs> So Daniel, if you'd like to let me know when you need me to change the slide, that'd be great. Right, on. Um, hi everyone, thank you for coming. I'm Daniel Baker, I'm a lawyer with the Citizen Representation Program of the EDO. Um, I'm speaking to you from Yuganiji land and want to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and that especially when we're talking about laws in Australia, acknowledge that First Nations law is, um, continues to exist and thrived and is still being practiced today. 
Um, I've got a background in criminal defence law and work with the Citizen Representation Program focusing on social participation in environmental movements. Um, and so I'll be speaking to you all today about protest laws and how they've been affected by COVID-19. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please, Raul. All right, so just to get started, I just wanted to, while I speak about a few of these things, have people read a few of these quotes that I've taken from news articles, um, and the next slide will contain a few headlines as well. We've heard a lot of different information and consumed a lot of media recently around COVID-19, as well as different kind of protests and what our rights are surrounding those kind of movements and how those two things are interacting with each other. And these things are depicted in different ways by the media. Um, and we've also heard of different kind of phrases such as protests being banned or protests being made illegal. And in this talk, I wanna try and clarify some of the language around that that's not exactly correct. Um, and trying to clarify for everyone what exactly their rights are surrounding these kinds of movements. If you go to the next slide, please, Rebel. Um, just here, we've got a few headlines. Um, we also see sometimes talk about different bail conditions that get applied to people that participate in these kinds of events. Um, and they also impose certain restrictions on people being able to associate with, you, with each other. And there's a certain criminalization element that goes along with some of these movements. Um, and it can be fairly controversial to participate in a certain way in these things. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So if we begin talking about, do we have a right to protest? We hear about different kinds of rights from places like the United States, where they've got the a constitutional right to freedom of speech. We don't exactly have that in Australia. Um, some of our jurisdictions have human rights legislation which support activities that are similar to protests. So for example, in Victoria, there's a charter of human rights and responsibilities. Um, we, we, then that asserts, for example, that everyone has a right to peaceful of assembly or freedom of association with each other, which might speak to some of those bail condition issues that we have where some people are being prohibited from associating with other people um, in the community. Um, another example is in Queensland, they've got what's called the Peaceful Assembly Act. Now that asserts a positive right to, people's right to peacefully assemble. Now, not all jurisdictions have these, um, but there's a few other tools that get used um, around to assert people's rights to some of those things. So you can go to the next slide, please. Most jurisdictions in Australia, so every state or territory may have their own process for this, has what's called authorised protest legislation. And we've seen some of this get used recently in the Black Lives Matter protests, where they're talking, of, this is the kind of legislation that's being used when people are talking about the protest is banned or the protest is made illegal. Effectively, what it is, is it's a process of notifying relevant authorities. This is normally the police themselves um, in some way of what exactly is being planned in a protest or a public demonstration. So this might be, we're going to walk from town hall to the library. We expect X amount of people to turn up and we're going to be protesting about this particular issue. Now there's a process that can then take place um, for the commissioner of police or the relevant authority in that area to authorize, or they might not um, even reply, in which case authorization is normally presumed, or they can actively oppose what has been proposed to them. Now, even if they oppose it, it doesn't mean that a protest or an assembly is illegal or it's been banned. What an authorization does for, for groups is it means that whatever is in that proposal, if that is accepted, um, that people cannot be held civilly or criminally liable for doing anything that's in line with what has been proposed. So normally it's blocking off a street and walking down a street where cars would normally run. In those situations, someone might normally be, if, if you had, didn't have authorization, you might have someone 
you might be charged with obstructing traffic. You can't normally just run in front of a road. So that's, and in this particular case, what we've seen where a uh, lawful assembly has been authorized, it would also mean that the COVID-19 restrictions don't apply. Um, but where there, where an application has been made to prohibit an event or that authorization has not been given, um, in the proper way and that's been properly communicated, it means that all the laws that normally apply in day-to-day -day life still apply. So that's what we're talking about when we look at authorised protest legislation. It wouldn't, and I'll speak about this particular right in a minute, it wouldn't actually be legal to ban people from assembling together, um, assembling together in any certain way. So if we go to the next slide please. So we've got in Australia, instead of having a, a positive right to protest or something that says every person has a right to protest or to demonstrate in any way that they like, we have what's called the implied right of freedom of political communication. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it is an implied right that's read into the Australian constitution, which is the legal document that creates the government, it creates the parliament, it creates the courts. It's the source of all power, all the power in the Australian state. So the way that, and the High Court, which is the highest court in Australia, interprets what the constitution actually means. And what they've read into that over time through different cases that have been heard by the High Court of Australia is that we, that reading through the provisions of the Australian constitution that we have an implied right of freedom of political communication. And that is something that is inalienable or cannot be changed by a government. Now what this, implied right does it doesn't work as a right to protest but it it works as something that restricts the australian government or the parliament from making laws that affect people's right to communicate political ideas so it's important to hang on to that distinction there it's something that stops the government from doing something and in that way it's seen as a right to the general pop population in a representative democracy so if you go to the next slide, please. The next step in kind of thinking about those ideas um, is this case of Brown and Tasmania, which happened a few years ago and, and dealt with um, some forestry le legislation in Tasmania. There were laws that were introduced, as you can see on the slide there, in the Workplaces Protection from Protesters Act. So it's an unusual law in certain ways because it specifically mentions um, protests itself and there were laws that were aimed at deterring protesters from undertaking certain activities in, in kind of businesses or kind of workplace areas. Now this case in, involved former Greens leader Bob Brown um, who was charged with one of the offences out under this act um, and he and another uh, journalist at the time challenged the laws themselves and took it to the High Court. Now the High Court found that the laws in that act um, were a burden or kind of unnecessarily affected the implied right of freedom of communicate, political communication, which included protest. So it was the first case that actively included protest in that right as a form of political communication. And that, that, that particular legislation in Tasmania um, is currently being redrafted and being debated at the moment. And we'll see what ends up happening with that. So if we go to the next slide, please. When we're looking at COVID-19, we're dealing with a few different things uh, and looking at how that particular right, the implied right of freedom of political communication um, and public health laws interact with each other. So and there's a few unique things about those about the COVID-19 public health restrictions that we're looking at, we can see that they're temporary laws. Um, they're normally made without the same kind of parliamentary scrutiny that we see. And also we're not able to see how those laws might be interpreted if they're challenged in a court. Um, and they're also applied with a certain amount of discretion. Um, they're also changing regularly as well. When we see these laws interact um, with people expressing a desire or, or actively kind of defying them um, and, and taking to the street in terms of asserting a right to protest um, or asserting 
their kind of position around that and seeing how they're policed in different situations. So if you go to the next slide, please. So the best examples that we've had, we've had a few examples over the whole period of COVID-19 of different protests being dealt with in different ways. I think the first one that I'm aware of was a protest in relation to um, refugees in Victoria where we had a convoy of cars that had moved around the front of a hotel where refugees were being held um, and they moved around in protest and each of those were fined despite what would norm at that time what would normally be considered social distancing um, but at that stage you weren't allowed to actually leave the house for a particular any other purpose than certain exceptions under those laws. In the Black Lives Matters protest more recently we had different responses to that when that first started um, to gear up. In South Australia we had a temporary lift of the public health orders that allowed that to happen and then the following week when another protest was being organized um, they weren't afforded that that same kind of leniency again and were told that the laws themselves would be enforced. Um, Victoria we had at first an acceptance where people were applying and trying to get authorization for those protests and when the numbers kind of blew out um, the police withdrew their, their authorization for them to be able to do that. And then we had kind of the largest of these in New South Wales where there were actually an application to the court for an active prohibition of the event itself um, and that resulted in an application to the Supreme Court on appeal of that decision. If you go to the next slide please Revel. In New South Wales the reason that that first Black Lives Matter protest was allowed to continue was more of a legal technicality than an assertion of a freedom or a right to, to protest or be in the street in those circumstances. Um, what really happened there was that an application for prohibiting the event was withdrawn when in the first application by police to the court to prohibit the event that was withdrawn when the court granted an injunction now the that decision was appealed the next day just before the event and the, the court of appeal ended up finding that they had not followed the correct process um, in granting that injunction and that injunction was overturned and there was not sufficient time for the police then to apply for the protest to be prohibited. The effect of that was that there's an assumption that it's authorized where that, that application hasn't been made. Um, so, and then what we're seeing now is this is kind of continuing to happen where we've got this interplay between how are these public health measures going to be enforced and where are people's kind of rights or position enabled to organize where we've seen certain events where people are able to abide by COVID-19 or they're in terms of social distancing or in terms of taking necessary safety measures but it's a constant balance that we're kind of trying to strike um, and that we're seeing be enforced or policed in different ways and in different place places. Um, so if you go to the next slide please. So it raises a lot of questions at the moment as to how a particular state or place should kind of enforce laws in situations where people are trying to communicate political ideas um, and have active participation in our democracy or in our society. Um, so we're trying to strike the balance between those things and I think it's open to everyone to kind of generate their own conclusion about where they stand on that. Um, but when we're looking at these laws as public health circumstances, we've had active declarations that, um, you know, certain conduct in our society are, are, does equate to public health emergencies or the ways that these are being enforced, are they being enforced in ways where public safety is at the, at the front of the priorities for it. Um, so we're certainly in interesting times for kind of protest laws and protest powers. Um, but just trying to encourage dialogue and kind of clarify what people's legal rights are in these circumstances. So I'll finish up there um, and hand you over to Nicole to continue talking um, about further process and economic recovery.
Thanks, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nicole Summer here. As uh, Revel said, I'm the managing lawyer for the Hobart office. Um, I first just want to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Muanina people here in Nipaluna, Hobart, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty to this land was never ceded. So today, um, what I'm going to be talking about is um, economic recovery might be front and, front and centre of everybody's mind in particular now that we've had a, um, a the uh, speech by the Prime Minister yesterday outlining uh, more what nationally we think economic recovery looks like. Um, I think I would start by saying we're at very early stages in understanding how governments will be approaching economic recovery and so part of what I'm going to be talking about is what has been done but what it looks like um, things uh, are going to, oh, sorry, what economic recovery measures might look like um, in the future. So Revel, for the next slide, please. Um, so the starting point is the two principles that um, Revel has referred to. Clearly with the public health response to COVID-19, economic consequences have followed for us as a nation and government action has now turned to economic recovery. So what we've done here is we think that it's helpful to provide a benchmark to assess government action in recovery against. Um, there'll be recovery um, measures both at a national level and um, as Revel says at a sub-national or state and territory level, probably also recovery measures at a local government level. So these principles can really be applied by you um, and by us in determining whether those recovery measures are appropriate. And we made that decision, um, there's lots of people who have talked about what economic recovery should look like, the Build Back Better kind of ideas, looking at renewable energy projects, regenerative agriculture and the like. But we thought that what it would be useful from a legal perspective to have a legal benchmark to measure those actions against. And part of what we um, uh, look at in principle four, so let me just move to principle four and principle five. Principle four really is um, about what economic stimulus and recovery measures will look like, how they incentivize, incentivize recovery and how they set us up for the future. And principle five is more of a defensive principle. It's talking about what we think our laws need to be doing at a minimum um, to protect the environment and to um, ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices are heard. So part of what underpins these principles is our knowledge that um, to meet the economic challenge of COVID-19, it will dictate the future um, for our environment and our climate. And that this really, these next 10 years are the decade of consequence. It's critical to meet our Paris commitments and to uh, meet the global uh, commitment to 1.5 degree warming, that we do something now for eco economic recovery. And that's why we say in principle four, that recovery must put us on a path to a safe and healthy climate. Um, and also, um, we're in an ecological crisis um, where uh, we're on extinction trajectories for a range of, um, of our uh, precious Australian species and biodiversity is in decline. Um, so there are international commitments around biodiversity as well, uh, the Aichi targets which are currently being negotiated. Um, and so we also need to look at restoring or recovering the environment. So those are two things um, that we think are important for principle four. Principle five is really more about regression of um, existing standards, um, uh, but also um, what we want our environmental laws to look like. So I'll talk about that. Next slide, Seth Revel, thank you. Um, so let's just start with what, has, what laws have been passed put them into basic categories because these are the categories um, really that we're looking at for, um, uh, for what has been done to date. Firstly, the acceleration of assessment processes. So there has been uh, New South Wales, in New South Wales in, at the national level in Victoria, there are kind of informal measures to accelerate assessment. In Tasmania, we've seen uh, an actual change to the planning legislation to um, uh, reduce the timeframes that councils have to assess uh, whether further information is required. So quite um, uh, screwed, uh, quite tight timeframes now, 14 days has changed to seven days. Um, but we're probably going to see more of that acceleration. So that's something to keep your eye on. 
There's changes to the level of oversight required. So in South Australia, there's been quite a large change in the COVID laws that were passed early on in March um, to the public works oversight. Normally, there's, a, uh, there's oversight and scrutiny by parliament uh, for public works that are worth over $4 million. Um, that's been changed to 10 million. So um, if there's changes to scrutiny and transparency that are occurring, um, and that's something to keep an eye on too. Of course, there's some planning exemptions for small builds. Um, that's the sort of thing that I think we'll see more of. The NT was the first jurisdiction to do this, and they had a small build planning exemption, which has already expired. It really was a temporary measure um, that expired on the 20th, 20th of April. Um, I suspect that we'll see more and more of that sort of small build exemption um, going forward. And then, of course, the thing that probably most of you would be interested, most interested in is um, the facilitation of major projects through new or existing processes. So in two jurisdictions, there's new laws being proposed. There's a bill, in fact, before the WA Parliament um, that will um, introduce a major projects coordination process where the um, Planning Commission makes a decision on a whole range of um, uh, different approvals, including overriding the EPA um, and Aboriginal heritage. And in Tasmania, there's a draft major projects bill with the same sort of coordination um, uh, process. Of course, we're also seeing um, facilitation of development or, or putting development into existing um, uh, um, major projects type processes, including, for instance, in Queensland, the Glencore um, mega coal mine has now been announced as a coordinated project, which will put it through that coordinated um, major projects process. Next slide, thanks, Rebel. Um, governments have also uh, established advisory bodies and fast track assessment processes within uh, various departments. Uh, a lot of you have already raised in the chat, I see uh, the Commonwealth National COVID-19 Coordination Commission, which has been in the news uh, as an advisory body. I'll talk more about that um, particular commission later, but there have been three other uh, um, jurisdictions that have put in place similar types of advisory councils, led by industry, not led by um, uh, what you would call independent experts. Um, and um, so, and also reporting to the premiers in, uh, or the chief minister in the case of the Northern Territory. We've seen in New South Wales and Queensland um, uh, internal government programs to speed up development or in the case of Queensland to, uh, to that coordination of projects through the Exclusive Transaction Initiative. Uh, next slide, thanks for everyone. Um, and so, um, Really, that's where we have, where we're up to. And then yesterday we had an announcement by the um, Prime Minister, which really does intersect with planning and environment laws in a very substantial way. Um, the Prime Minister made a speech um, to uh, CEDA, which is, I think, the Committee or the uh, Council for Economic Development in Australia. And he outlined um, how infrastructure development and um, major projects approvals um, are going to be front and centre of economic recovery nationally and how that's going to work through National Cabinet. A lot of the detail is missing from what this means, but what is on the screen now is really a, a summary of, of what uh, the Prime Minister indicated yesterday. So identification of 15 major projects, uh, major infrastructure projects, including the South Australian um, Olympic Dam, uh, which is quite a controversial development there, also uh, the Marinus uh, Basslink interconnector, uh, which is part of the Battery of the Nation project in Tasmania, for instance. Um, there's a lot of uh, money to be spent on various infrastructure projects like roads, rails, dams, poles and wires, um, and maybe we'll see some legislation to facilitate um, that development um, in future, or it may simply be through grants to the com to, uh, states and councils. Um, there's uh, the main thing to think about here is um, the, the flagging of an intention to do something about how the National Environmental Law, the EPBC Act or the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act work. 
Um, the Prime Minister um, very clearly made uh, the point that, he, that they're looking at accelerating assessments under the EPBC Act, looking at single touch approvals um, and uh, streamlining Commonwealth and state processes and having the Productivity Commission look at a national deregulation agenda. So there's already a deregulation task force, I think, in Treasury, but the Prime Minister is bringing that into his department. Um, and uh, I think it's it's got quite a, a, a development uh, focus to it from the basis from what he said in his speech yesterday. He also flagged new assessment processes for states and ter territories and specifically named up the major projects legislation in WA. Um, next slide, thanks, Rebel. Um, so let's, I wanted to unpack a little bit of, of what is, uh, what this announcement means, um, because really it was only done, uh, only announced yesterday and we haven't really um, seen any detail, but let's think about some of the language that's been used. So when we're talking about the removal of duplication and streamlining, sorry, that says streamlining, not streamlining, um, it really will depend on the detail, of course, but um, uh, really what we think this means is a one-stop shop. And in fact, the Minister for Cities, Minister Tudge, was on AM in the morning talking about a one-stop shop. So we know what that is. We've seen that before. And really what that means is um, a, what's called a uh, bilateral approvals agreement under the EPBC Act, whereby the Commonwealth says um, you don't need an EPBC Act approval if you get an approval by a state or territory under one of these laws. So it's taking the Commonwealth out of environment assessment altogether. That's what a one-stop shop is. Um, and this is really entirely relied on how good state and territory laws are, how good institutions are, and how good compliance at that level is. And there are plenty of examples of poor state laws or poor adherence to them. Um, a good example of that, of an accredited process, is the regional forest agreements. Um, we think this is a bad idea. Why is it a bad idea? Well, we need national oversight of environmental laws for a couple of reasons. One is that the states inherently have a conflict of interest and economic um, considerations will always trump environmental considerations. The economic imperative at the state level creates that conflict. There's plenty of examples of this in law. Um, the classic example, of course, is the Franklin Dams case in Tasmania, but the Hindmarsh Island Bridge case and um, the sand mining case, I think in Queensland, which really was the impetus for the EBBC Act. Um, but secondly, the Commonwealth Government is, is the body responsible for implementing our international obligations. So under international law, um, there's a protection for a range of things, including world heritage sites, our threatened species, biodiversity, um, and, and our Ramsar, wetlands um, and that is the proper role of the national government to uh, deliver on environmental standards for those things. So if we're talking about biodiversity for instance, um, the uh, Commonwealth Government has signed up to the Biodiversity Convention and there are negotiations about how to improve the lot of biodiversity at the moment which would probably lead to targets. Commonwealth Government will be responsible for those targets and um, they can't delegate that responsibility down to the states. There's another concern that um, we have, which is that at the same time as we're talking about a one-stop shop, we're seeing new laws enacted to facilitate development at the state level. So if we see a deferral at the national level to new laws put in place specifically to facilitate COVID-19 recovery, um, uh, economic development, then um, we have to wonder whether they're up to the job. Um, I think we'd also just be concerned that when we urgently need a strengthening of environmental laws, we may be looking at turning off the national environmental law um, and that we need to maintain that scrutiny and oversight. Let's move to acceleration then. What is meant by acceleration? I think in principle, we would say um, that it's a good idea to, um, it's a good idea to uh, accelerate uh, uh, assessments um, if, if it can be accelerated, but um, the way that we see acceleration of development is um, the, the problem in the system is probably not at the bureaucracy level. The problem uh, that we see is that um, uh, the, the delays are at the environmental impact statement stage. So proponents are required to prepare 
detailed environmental impact um, statements and sometimes respond to further information uh, requests from um, people assessing them. And often it takes a very long time for them to come back. So when we're talking about three and a half year timeframes, it may be that that's the reason for the delay. Um, a second reason is that the Environment Department has been uh, squeezed on funding for some time and perhaps it is the fact that what, what it needs is more resources um, and are not faster timeframes. We'd be concerned if it was the other way around. So we wouldn't want to see um, uh, a squeeze on assessment timeframes uh, within the bureaucracy because that has the potential to undermine the quality of assessment of the, of the bureaucracy. Um, it's, environment assessment isn't a tick box exercise and we want better environmental impact assessment, not worse. It may also be that acceleration refers to reducing public notice periods or public comment and we wouldn't want to see that either. So our test is, does it result in a reduction in community participation or in the scrutiny of environmental assessment? And we'll have to wait and see on that front. Um, the next slide, thanks. Um, I want to now touch on First Nations people because it seems to us that there, it's a voice missing from the recovery discussion on the whole. Um, what we have seen, um, oh sorry, we, we know too well the cost to First Nations people of economic development at all costs. We've seen that very publicly in the recent destruction of the ancient heritage site of the Putuquinti Karama traditional owners in Western Pilbara um, by Rio Tinto. And we know that the law didn't protect that site. We know that neither the WA state law or the National Heritage Protection Act protected that site. So when we're talking about accelerating assessment processes and fast tracking development, yes, we've heard from the Minister, Minister Tudge, that it will not be at the cost of standards. However, at least in this instance, we know that our current standards are not up to the task. Um, so we'd be very concerned that it would un further undermine um, the ability for First Nations people to protect their culture and heritage. The other thing that I'd say is that there's reform underway in the cultural heritage space in four states. So um, two states in WA and in my home state of Tasmania, that reform is sorely overdue. We have the worst laws in the country on Aboriginal heritage. We also know that um, Ben Wyatt, the WA Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, who's very much been in the media recently in relation to the Rio Tinto issue, has talked about reform at the national level, and that would be very welcome. So, we would really want to see this opportunity being um, a way to make real change and to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a genuine say um, in relation to their culture and heritage. And that would be a concern of ours. Thanks everyone, next slide. And finally, um, here I get to the issue of accountability and transparency and uh, the role of the advisory committees that I touched on before. But I want to start by saying that this is a time when I think we need more, transparent, more transparency, not less, because the decisions that we make now are going to lock in long-term economic and development pathways. So let's take a look at the advisory bodies. Well, these bodies are in pretty extraordinary positions of power in terms of their ability to influence government policy. The National COVID Coordination Committee is uh, a non-statutory authority which has been brought into the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. So it's part of the department and it sits at the same sort of level as all of the other parts of the bureaucracy within that department. It, it advises direct to the Prime Minister. But what's interesting about that committee is that it's not, sorry, the commission, is that it's not what you would say an expert advisory body would look like in the usual sense. It hasn't been appointed by, for its expertise, um, but in relation to its ties to industry. We need to think about why this is. Why was it brought into being in the first place? Well, initially it was intended to provide direct advice to the Prime Minister to coordinate the immediate health response. So what needed to be done at that stage was to shore up supply chains, ensure adequate PPE and health supplies, 
um, help businesses continue to operate, work with unions so that we had safe working conditions through this process. And really those were very necessary actions um, and it sort of made sense to have industry people, um, industry leaders, I should say, um, uh, as part of that discussion and, and helping coordinate that. But what it has, what it's tasked with now, and there's evidence given to the Senate Select Committee that makes this clear, is economic recovery. So in relation to that, there are very real questions about the interests held by its members. Nev Power, who is the chair, um, he's the, uh, also chair of a large gas company. Um, there's the Managing Director of Energy Australia. There's other links to gas um, and the like in the, in the composition of that body. Um, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has confirmed that there is a conflict of interest reporting requirement, but we don't really have any transparency over how those conflicts are reported or what actions taken on them. Um, and even if there isn't a direct conflict of interest in a technical sense, um, one could foresee that a group of industry representatives who are from uh, the energy sector uh, are likely to have a very fixed view about the pathway out of recession and a vision for our country. Um, so it wouldn't be that surprising if they recommended a gas led recovery. Um, normally, a, a statutory corporation would be set up under legislation, so you would know what their mandate is, what their functions and powers are, what they're attempting to achieve and what their duties are, and you can hold them to that. But that's not the case here. This is part of the department. And so the scrutiny that we get is through the Senate um, uh, Select Committee. The second thing I would say is, and I've, look, I've read the transcripts from the Senate Select Committee, is that there's a particular task force set up to consider, um, uh, sorry, under the commission, there is a task force set up to consider uh, manufacturing response. Um, and that task force um, has no government governance requirements, is made up of industry volunteers, um, and there's no conflict of interest declarations. It is that task force that produced um, the, the leaked draft uh, gas lead recovery discussion paper. And we may not see that discussion paper, but it, it's, uh, we have to remember that the task force is, that's part of the commission um, has less uh, transparency than the commission itself. The third, the third thing that I would say is that the bodies aren't representative in any real sense. So if you look at other, the other commissions, the only one that has an, any Aboriginal representative is the NT Commission, who has, an, um, who has Nick Dodson on it. Um, there's no one with any scientific background. Uh, there's only one community representative and that's in Tasmania. Um, and there's only one with a renewable energy entrepreneur who is in the NT as well. Largely, it's made up of industry and property representatives. Um, so I think we'd say that there's need for more oversight, not less. Um, there's been some questions asked about how it is that the commission, the National Commission was set up. It's not actually very well explained on the website. I've trawled through the select Senate Select Committee um, transcripts to try to work it out and I'm a lawyer. And I think what we need to see is, you know, what is the commission doing? How is it set up? Who is it reporting to? What are the conflict of interest declaration processes? So that we have an idea of, of what reporting is occurring and what advice is being given to government. Uh, next slide, please, Rebel. I'll stop, uh, I'm conscious of the time and I will stop talking to, soon, but just briefly, um, this, is a, this is the full principle, principle five, against which we can measure these standards. All I'll say is that um, go and have a look at this in detail and think about what's being done at various, um, at the Commonwealth and at the state level. I think that we would say that if you measured what's happened to date uh, against this principle, the jury is still out, but it's not looking good. I think there's a mixed response um, across the country, um, uh, but you would want to see more transparency around how these decisions are being made, and we would want to see a non-regression non of standards. Uh, next, next slide, thanks, Rebel. And just finally, um, I'm going to end on principle four, which is somewhat counterintuitive. I started with principle five and ended with principle four, but I wanted to end on a, on a more positive message with a message of hope. So, um, you know, this is really an opportunity to shift our economic narrative to one that puts us on a pathway to meet our Paris commitments.
and to strike a new deal for nature. And we think we should take that opportunity. Um, we think that um, government should be held against that standard um, and that action should be judged in accordance with that narrative. Um, putting it into a legal con context, there is in fact a legal principle that tells us how we balance economic, social and environmental considerations. Of course, that is the principle of ecologically sustainable development. So let's measure um, how governments respond against that existing legal principle. We know how it operates and we know what it means. I think that the last thing that I would say is that um, just looking at the EPBC Act and the flagging of an intention to alter that act, it is currently under review and we wouldn't want to see anything that prejudices good environmental outcomes under that review. Um, there, the EDO made a, a fairly exhaustive <laughs> submission to the EPBC Act review, which set out a range of measures to provide certainty and investment. Um, to the environment. There's things like bioregional plans that identify no-go areas, smart targets for recovery of biodiversity, national environmental accounts, um, clear criteria for decisions and referrals which provide certainty both to the environment and um, to uh, people who need approvals, and science-based outcomes assessment. We really need laws that recognise human health and ecosystem health are inextricably linked and that put us on the safe climate um, pathway. Um, so ne next slide, Rebel. So thank you that in conclusion, you know, we are facing enormous um, uh, economic challenge in response to the enormous health challenge we've, we are fa also facing, but it's an opportunity to get the legal settings right. The law is a tool, let's use it in a positive way is what we would say. And on that note, I think I'll open it up to 20 minutes of questions. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, there's been some fantastic questions um, coming through the chat. There's been lots of comments too, which I'm not going to read out, but thank you for um, to all the people who took the time to share your views with us. Um, I think, like, based on what I was looking at in the chat, the COVID Commission seemed to um, get a lot of people's attention. There's quite a few questions here around, you know, how the government has been able to um, create this commission in the way that it has um, with the representatives um, that it has chosen and questions around how um, accountable the commission is to the public when it's only reporting to the PM and Cabinet. So um, I think what that all boils down to is a question from Rosemary, which was how can the community respond to the Commission's actions? Well, that's a very difficult question. I saw that one come through. <laughs> the first, I, let me just deal with the transparency aspect first. Part of the, so the, the, that particular Commission reports directly to the Prime Minister. So there's an organisational structure for the Department of Premier and Cabinet, sorry, Prime Minister and Cabinet, which sets that out. Um, and uh, it is clear from the evidence that's been given that there are there is reporting going to the Prime Minister, but of course we don't know what that reporting is. Um, I suspect that the 15 infrastructure projects that we've seen announced yesterday has come out of that reporting, but again, no transparency over where that list comes from. Comes from. So I think what we'd want to see is better transparency from the Prime Minister about that. Um, uh, there have been suggestions that if you're going to set up a commission like this, then you should put it into legislation. And of course, the Commonwealth could have done that and other states and territories could have done that as well. Um, so that you do have uh, oversight as to what their functions and powers are and what their mandate is. We don't have that here. Um, uh, I think in terms of what the community, uh, the, sorry, the third thing I would say is reporting to National Cabinet um, so bringing together COAG into National Cabinet um, means that those discussions aren't in public, they'd be subject to the Cabinet and confidence principles and exemptions from freedom of information laws. So there's, if, if there's a report that goes to Cabinet, um, uh, the CEO of the Commission gave evidence that that would be subject to that Cabinet exemption in the FOI law. 
Um, so that's part of the transparency issue is if it goes to cabinet, we won't be able to see it. Uh, the, if the community is particularly concerned, of course, the commission is subject to FOI laws because it's in part of the department. I looked at this, it's the case. Um, so uh, you could uh, seek that information. Otherwise, um, the thing that you would normally do is, of course, write to your local member um, uh, or to ministers about those things. And you might want to reference our principles. I mean, that's one way of saying this is what we think should be done. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, Fast Tracking also got um, a fair few comments and questions. Um, so one was that the New South Wales Fast Track um, assessment tranches don't appear to be um, getting any reasons for decisions, which is a legislative requirement in New South Wales. And the question was um, around, you know, you know, is the government going to provide the reasons for its decisions for these fast track proposals? Do you have do you know do you know the answer to that one, or do you want me to, to take that because I'm the Sydney lawyer in the room? That'd be great, Jamila. I, I <laughs> a good question. I saw it come through and was something I was um, hoping you'd be able to answer as a Sydney lawyer. Um, look, there, look, it's a legislative requirement for consent authorities to provide reasons for their decisions. That's a, a requirement under the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act and regulation. I'm not aware of any exemption from that under the COVID laws um, or the changes to the, to the, the EP&A Act that came through um, with COVID. But that's, um, that's not a definitive answer, I'm afraid. I, I just, I'm not aware that they exempted themselves or any other consent authorities from that requirement, which would then default to the position that that requirement stands and reasons for decisions can be expected. Um, the other um, question was around, um, it, it was about, you know, fast tracking is happening under existing legislation in New South Wales. Um, and there's no assurance it will be stopped anytime soon. So is there any grounds to challenge that? And I, I think that's probably straying into the realm of legal advice. And we might need to leave that one alone and refer that question to our advice line. But definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Where, where power, how powers are being used and um, if there is a need to challenge them, what powers there are to challenge them. And that might be, as you say, this is not legal advice, <laughs> but, you know, judicial review processes and, and um, normal backup administrative law processes generally can still apply to, to these decisions. Often, um, you know, if they're decisions that are being made quickly, say for tree clearing, that's always a concern where um, actions can be taken that have significant impacts quite quickly. However, um, where there are decisions that, um, you know, can be subject to a, well, I mean, clearing can be subject to a court process still, obviously. Um, but yeah, suffice to say, as, as Jamila says, we're keeping an eye on these um, issues. And if the community does see concerning um, decisions um, being undertaken under these laws, please do let us know, because we, um, obviously uh, can't keep abreast of every single thing going on and um, it's fantastic to have the community taking their watchdog role as well and um, and helping work with the EDO to, to keep the government to account. Thanks Revel. Um, a couple of questions seem to relate to green tape, the, this idea of cutting green tape and um, speeding up processes and you know, some of the questions were around, you know, is this um, possible to, to build these efficiencies into our environmental laws and still maintain environmental protections? Or um, because, you know, one, one of our um, audience said, you know, isn't reducing delays and improving environmental standards, aren't they diametrically opposed? Um, and that relates to some, some questions around how can we stop governments from ripping out these legal protections for the environment and how can accountable for these destructive moves. So I think they kind of, I'm bundling all of those in together. Um, I think it's mainly related to EPBC stuff. Yeah, so I'd be very happy for Revel to also jump in here, but um, just starting from the EPBC Act perspective, if you go back to our, our EDO submission, we think that there's ways that you can provide better certainty to people which may streamline um, assessment processes and things like certainty around what um, uh, what must be assessed under, under Commonwealth law, better criteria around that, those decisions and knowing exactly, you know, no-go areas, a classic example, 
if there's a if if you're developing on a Ramsar site, maybe that's a no-go area, for instance. Uh, but but we have ambiguity in the current law, and we think that ambiguity needs to be clarified. And that's often the reason why there's a lot of back and forth or uh, and the like um, at the Commonwealth level. But I think we also need to be careful about buying into the idea of needing to speed up assessment processes, because what we want is quality environmental assessment. Um, and scientific work takes time. Um, that's all there is to it. If it's a long-term project with long-term environmental impacts, then those impacts need to be assessed. And unfortunately, as I said, often the delay is really at the developer's end um, because they, it takes a lot of time to develop an environmental impact statement. Or it takes a lot of time uh, to respond to proper and appropriate questions from uh, the people assessing that development. Um, so I think that if you wanted to say that you'd need to speed up processes, maybe you'd look at deemed refusal periods where if you don't get your AIS in on time, um, then, uh, then it's a deemed refusal. But um, uh, rather than having development sitting around in the system for a long period of time. But I really think we should be cautious about saying that we have, must speed up uh, uh, assessment processes. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, this is an old debate. <laughs> if we're talking about COVID recovery, and that's what we're really talking about, um, why are we talking about uh, long-term uh, three-year assessments? Um, we're not going to get jobs in the ground, something that it's going to take 21 months at a minimum to assess, um, and then maybe a four-year uh, time frame for any commencement. Um, I think that we need to be careful about locking in long-term changes to environmental standards um, under the guise of COVID when what we should be talking about is immediate recovery measures, things that, things that are called shovel ready and the like. That's the sort of thing that we should be looking at. I wouldn't mind just that. Yeah, is that okay? Um, mm. uh, I agree with everything Nicole said. I just wanted to also add um, just ensuring the quality of EISs that are being provided to government would go a significant way to, um, I guess, limiting the need for so many information requests to be made and, and further supplementary EISs and also for the community to spend so long um, scrutinising um, poor quality EISs that are coming through, um, including through court processes, if the material the proponents are required to put forward is of a very high quality and site specific and it's the best available information to actually provide the impact assessment that the government needs to do its job, also coupled with the um, criteria that decision makers are being uh, are using when they're assessing it, being very clear and actually leading to um, appropriate environmental protections being provided, then you're getting um, better environmental protection and community protection along the way, um, and also reducing the time frame of the assessment process and any court processes um, afterwards, because hopefully there wouldn't be a need for them <laughs> anymore because the, the assessment's been done well. So um, there are many ways, it, it's not at all diametrically opposed that we could get shortcuts to the assessment process that actually lead to everybody having more certainty and the process being clearer um, and, and shortened compared to what we have today. Thanks, Rebel. Uh, question about courts, um, using New South Wales Land and Environment Court as an example of um, restricting on-site hearings and the, 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 where the people can come, where object objectors can come and address the court um, due to COVID restrictions. And um, just a question around, you know, is there any indication when those sorts of restrictions will begin to lift? Any, any, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I, look, I need to double check the Land and Environment Court um, today on where they're up to. I know a lot of courts are actually moving towards allowing um, at least limited people to actually attend the court and also slowly working out ways that they can provide for public um, witnessing of, of proceedings in various ways. Uh, as we saw through the Shenmire example that I um, mentioned, um, I'm sorry that I can't speak on the spot because things are changing um, so quickly. I, I didn't check the, each of the courts um, at the, today, but um, we would hope that um, courts are, given that restrictions are easing, are slowly starting to, to open up to public, um, public witnessing of their, of their hearings because there is such a public interest in this. 
No. Absolutely. I, I know the land that. that. Wouldn't it be great to have um, more online hearings so that you could watch? I mean, in the US, for instance, you can watch um, public hearings of note. Um, the High Court has allowed for watching of public hearings of note or at least obtaining the video afterwards so you can see how things have unfolded. And wouldn't it be great to have courts around the country move to that model? Yeah, COVID certainly seems to have um, catapulted many of our courts into the 21st century in terms of technology use. And hopefully they will retain that um, into the future to allow a bit more accessibility. I know the COVID, um, the Land and Environment Court in New South Wales has a COVID-19 pandemic arrangement policy where those current, where its current arrangements are set out. Um, it does clearly indicate that they're intended to be temporary. So we can expect the court to lift those um, as and when it can in compliance with other health restrictions. Um, there was another question about the lead beta possums case, which we didn't run, but it was around, you know, will, um, will, that, will the decision in that case have any, implica any implications more broadly in other jurisdictions? Like they mentioned New South Wales, but um, if those of you who don't know, um, it, it's related to the APBC Act and um, regional forest agreements. And um, the federal court, I believe, found that um, forestry um, practices in Victoria um, were not compliant um, with, uh, with the... Uh, the RFA in a sense. Oh, yeah, so I think, let me just, I, I can I can jump in on that mm -hmm. one, Jamala. The, um, uh, the starting point is that it was, uh, it's a case in relation to the practices of Vic Forests. Um, and so the practices of Vic Forests were found to not comply with the state code. And because they didn't comply with the state code, which is picked up under the Regional Forest Agreement, um, it was found to not have the benefit of an exemption from the EPBC Act. So that case right. is still before the courts um, uh, as to whether um, uh, the form of the declaration the court's going to make, so um, about what that means for the EBBC Act and um, whether any injunction is going to be, um, uh, or order is going to be made against big forests in relation to those particular coops. Um, as to whether it has implications elsewhere, um, I suspect that um, uh, all of us have read the case and we're thinking about those things, but I think that's probably bordering on legal advice. Um, uh, if you have particular forestry concerns, then um, uh, please contact the Sydney office um, uh, for specific advice. Um, we've probably got time for one more um, question. There's a comment here, which I think is really worthwhile um, repeating from Anna who says online hearings are great for people with great internet and technology, but they're not really suitable for a lot of people in regional areas. Um, and this is particularly playing out with regards to the Narrabri gas pro um, project being uh, public hearing being online um, and how that might be cutting out many of the stakeholders who would otherwise like to attend that hearing. I think that's worth- It cuts um, both ways, absolutely. Yeah, it does. Um, so I don't think there's gonna be any replacement for face-to-face for, -face for for some time for many people um, in regional Australia. Um, how do we make the government consider all submissions on the EPBC Act? Um, can I, uh, on that point, can I say the um, Prime Minister has indicated that National Cabinet will be considering Graham Samuel's interim report, which he expects, I think they said that he expects in the next two weeks. Um, so we, uh, on the, the, sorry, the um, review body for the EPBC Act has indicated that they will be releasing an interim report. So I hope that that's publicly available. Um, and um, I guess then the next steps are going to be the question, what does the government do in relation to that interim report? We've had the Environment Minister, Susan Lay, indicate that um, she, she won't look at changes to the EPBC Act. Um, uh, in the next sitting of Parliament. Uh, so we'd be very uh, cautious about what that might mean at this stage, but we certainly wouldn't want to see any undermining of environmental uh, protections in the EPBC Act. How do we make governments consider all submissions on the EPBC Act? I think, again, it's just picking up the phone to your local member. That's the only thing I could suggest um, and keeping scrutiny on this issue. Okay, well, it's 1.59. I think our meeting just cuts out, doesn't it, at 2 p.m.? Is that correct? No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, then we might be able to keep going for one more question. Um, 
Can anyone comment on a pro we're, we'll stick to the APBC Act. Um, can anyone of you comment on the prospect prospects for achieving a water trigger in um, in the EPBC Act and will the review consider that? Shall I um, have a crack? Please feel free to jump in as well. Um, obviously, so there is a water trigger in the EPBC Act at the moment, um, but it is only specific to, to large scale mining and CSG activities. Um, we are definitely supportive of keeping that. It has been, it is, water is such a huge issue in Australia that um, we need to ensure it's a, it is a matter of national environmental significance. Truly. And so um, we definitely are advocating for that trigger to remain and also to be extended to any activity that's going to have a significant impact on water. Um, and as Nicole mentioned, there is a, an interim report coming out shortly from the panel. We will be scrutinising that closely to see what the recommendations are around the water trigger. I know that there um, are definitely resource industry submissions in before the panel that are seeking for the trigger to be removed. Um, and so uh, we actually don't know at this point um, what position the panel has, but rest assured that it is definitely on our radar. And, um, and uh, going forward, I can just highly recommend that everybody stays um, uh, attuned to this review. It's a very significant review. Our federal environment laws, it, nobody needs explaining um, here, I'm sure, how important they are. Um, and so this review is such a significant moment that everybody um, continuing to talk about the important role of our environment laws generally in Australia and protecting our beautiful asset, environmental assets and values that we have around this nation uh, and ensuring we can all move sustainably into the future and maintain these for future generations. Uh, it's just so important. So. Um, we at EDO will be scrutinising the interim report and putting out any commentary um, we feel is necessary on that. And um, so please keep an eye on our materials. Uh, if you're not on social, on our social media pages and um, are part of our newsletter, please do sign up because we'll push all of our um, recommendations and um, um, thoughts and opportunities for comments through those um, so you can stay abreast of it. Um, but it's just so great to see so many people so engaged in, in our environment laws. Um, can I just add to that about, about the water trigger? I guess the idea of a one-stop shop is something that would cause us some concern. Um, if there's a one-stop shop uh, for uh, envir national environmental approvals, that will include anything that was, is currently covered under the water tr trigger. Um, uh, and so then you'd be back to assessing it at a state, a state level. Um, so please be aware of that when we're talking about the EPBC Act review. But just echoing what Revel said, um, thanks so much for coming today. It's been a real pleasure to present to everyone and um, stay informed. Thanks for coming everyone. It's been great to see so many of you here. Thanks all. And a recording will be on our website just to answer that last question. Super. Have a good day.